Heavy artillery attacks kill at least three people in the outskirts of Donetsk in east Ukraine, with residential areas pounded by shells as the army tries to retake the city from local militia. Fast food is leaving a sour taste for Russian regulators who are suing McDonald's today over quality against the backdrop of escalating tit-for-tat sanctions between Moscow and the West. And Washington considers evacuating Iraqi refugees blockaded by jihadist fighters. It's also sending over 100 additional military advisers to help Kurdish troops. Amid concern, the US is getting too deeply involved. Hello, you're watching RT International. We're coming to you live from Moscow, where it's now midday. It's good to have you with us. At least three people have been killed in fresh Ukrainian army attacks on the outskirts of Donetsk, where troops are closing in and vowing a major offensive. Locals are being told to get out of the city. This area came under heavy fire on Tuesday night and is the current front line in the conflict. A market and several apartment blocks were pounded by shells in the main square. Residents helped firefighters put out the flames. It's thought a 19-year-old man and an elderly woman are among the victims. Many have now been left homeless as a result of the bombardment. Tens of thousands of people across eastern Ukraine have been forced to flee the violence in recent months, most of them to Russia. Maria Fnoshna followed some of the refugees as they left their homes in the city of Lugansk. Valentina is alone in her dark apartment in Lugansk. Pecking. There has been no electricity in most of the city for almost two weeks now, and the shelling continues. Valentina has already sent her daughter and her granddaughter to family friends in Russia. They didn't see each other for a month. We meet her when she's getting ready to follow them. We will accompany her all the way to the border. Life just stopped for us. We wake up, stand in the bread line for two hours, then get water. And then we cook a meal to eat, and the same thing happens every day. At least when we're standing in line, we can all listen to the news on the radio. Valentina's husband was due to come back from a trip to their country house this morning, but he's still not back. The phones are down, and she has no way of knowing what's delayed him. But with daily bombings, she can't help but be worried. There is no connection, so I don't even know what happened to him. Maybe he went to visit his brother. Valentina puts in her girl's winter clothes and finishes packing. She leaves her home with six bags and a very heavy heart. Zinaida from Lugansk region has cancer. Her home was shelled twice, but she tries to remain buoyant. But even her optimism was not enough to deal with what she saw the day that convinced her she can't stay in Lugansk. I was at a bus stop and then I decided to leave for some reason. As soon as I left the bus stop, a shell exploded right behind me. Five people died. One man had his head blown off and a woman lost her leg. It took me three days to get over it. She says making the decision to leave was not an easy one but it was a very quick one. It's not about the fear of death, but more of outright panic. Why is all this going on? What is this for? There are peaceful people here. Zinaida leaves and, just like many others, hopes to come back. But she fears that she will never be able to do so. While we talk to Zinaida, Valentina reunites with her husband, Andre. Public transportation is sporadic at best, and he missed his bus with no way to call home. It's less than 60 kilometers from Lugansk to the border, but this journey might seem endless to those forced to flee. Already in Russia, it's a mixture of pain, anger, despair and hope as these people turn a new page of their lives. Zinaida, Valentina and her husband will spend some time in this refugee camp at the Russian-Ukrainian border until they manage to get to their final destinations, joining thousands of others who fled eastern Ukraine, leaving their lives and homes behind them. They do not know what tomorrow holds in store, but at least they say the war is now behind them. Marie Fnoshna, RT, in Ukraine, 
and Russia. Well, we've just received video uh, from near Donetsk. Some of this is uh, graphic. Up to 15 Ukrainian troops were reportedly killed after their bus was attacked by local militia. Some media suggest those on the vehicle were fighters from the radical right sector group. It's thought the bus mistakenly arrived at an anti-government checkpoint after being sent to the wrong location. Kiev is sending mixed messages about the whereabouts of missing Russian journalist Andrei Stenin as international pressure grows for his release. Officials originally denied detaining the photographer, but here's what an advisor to Kiev's interior minister told a Latvian radio station. Anton Gerashenka added that Andrei is being held because he suspected of aiding terrorists. But when his employer, the RIA Novosti News Agency, asked for a comment, the Ukrainian official made quite a U-turn. The 33-year-old journalist has been missing for more than a week and rights groups are lining up in support. The Committee to Protect Journalists says if Ukrainian authorities are holding him, the reporter should be released immediately. Amnesty International is also voicing concern, stressing that journalists shouldn't have any restrictions in their work. And here's the statement from the Reporters Committee. It says that journalists must be free to cover all controversies without being penalised for doing their jobs. Well, we'll keep you posted on what's happening with Andre Stenin. Over at RT.com, we've lined up a collection of some of the photojournalists' most acclaimed work while documenting events in Kiev and eastern Ukraine. Kiev says it's ready to accept the humanitarian aid being sent from Russia after Moscow agreed to a Ukrainian presence in the convoy. Officials in Kiev earlier refused to let Russian trucks cross the border, demanding the cargo be reloaded onto different vehicles. It's because Kiev suspected Moscow of using the relief mission as a cover to smuggle arms to anti-government forces in eastern Ukraine. It backtracked after Russia agreed to let representatives of the Red Cross, the European security watchdog and Ukrainian authorities on board. Nearly 300 trucks are now on their way to the border, carrying generators, hundreds of tons of products, including baby food, water, medical supplies and sleeping bags. The Red Cross confirms it's received a detailed list of the aid. Russia's foreign minister says all the details of the deal with Kiev have been ironed out. The movement of the convoy has begun. We got the note confirming Ukraine's readiness to receive this help. On top of that, we took into account all the wishes of the Ukrainian side regarding this operation, including the route that was chosen, even though this means we have to take a large detour. We are relying on the assurances given by the Ukrainians. They guarantee the security of the convoy during its movement through regions controlled by the country's army. We also expect the same attitude from the self-defense forces. Washington is stepping up its involvement in Iraq. It's considering the urgent evacuation of refugees who are under jihadist siege. The UN has warned the situation might escalate within days or even hours. Tens of thousands of civilians from the Yazidi sect were forced to flee their homes but eventually found themselves trapped by Islamic State fighters on Mount Sinjar in Iraq's north. The US and its Western allies have been airdropping humanitarian food parcels while 130 military advisers have been sent to the area to assess the situation. Washington earlier announced it will directly arm Iraq's Kurds with light weaponry and ammunition. Ghani Chichikan considers why the U.S. is keen on protecting the minority. The militants of the Islamic State have been seizing control of vast swaths of Iraq for months now. But when they approached its Kurdish region, the U.S. took action. This uh, is a humanitarian issue of uh, great consequence uh, for all of the world. The militants threaten not just the people of the Kurdish region, but also its oil production. Since the U.S. invasion in 2003, Iraq's Kurdistan has seen a boom in energy production. U.S. energy giants ExxonMobil and Chevron are among the many oil and gas firms, large and small, now drilling there. It seems that uh, the fact that there are American oil companies operating uh, in the Kurdish region in the north of Iraq uh, had uh, some weight uh, and uh, it was one of the main considerations uh, that the Obama administration 
uh, took a while thinking about uh, re-engaging militarily in Iraq this month. The semi-autonomous region has shown to be friendly to the U.S. and to U.S. business. But the oil-rich Kurdistan has long sought to break away from Iraq. It has now moved to sell crude independently from Baghdad, arguing that the central government doesn't give the region its fair share of oil revenue. Amid the onslaught of the Islamic State and the political turmoil in Baghdad, many Kurds see an opportunity to finally carve out a homeland. By exclusively supporting the Kurdish region, Washington may fuel their cause. The, the Kurdish region uh, is functional the way we would like to, right. to see it. And it is tolerant of other sects yeah. and other religions uh, in a way that uh, uh, you know, we'd like to see uh, elsewhere. So we do think that it's important to make sure that that space is protected. The Obama administration likes the way Kurdistan functions, but doesn't like the way Iraq as a whole functions. The Obama administration denies that it gave up on the central government in Baghdad, moving to directly protect U.S. interests. With humanitarian situations so dire and the threat posed by the Islamic State so imminent, America's increased involvement may not have much opposition now, even if the eventual outcome will be the breakup of Iraq. In Washington, I'm Ganesh Chakyan, RT. Former U.S. Congressman and presidential candidate Ron Paul spoke exclusively to RT on the prospects for America's latest moves in Iraq. He told us the United States risks sinking deeper into the conflict unless it leaves Iraqis to deal with the Islamic State on their own. The Kurds have always had this reputation of being great fighters and uh, that they're very good at it. And uh, I'm surprised that they haven't uh, retaliated a little bit better. But one of the reasons why they haven't done very well is that ISIS ended up getting a lot of weapons from us. And uh, they, they've they captured weapons. They've got them out of Syria. And I'm sure there's some that came from Libya. So they're well armed. So we haven't done the Kurds any favor whatsoever. So I think the sooner we get out of there, the, the better. I think the policy that we should follow is one designed to allow the Iraqis to solve all their problems and stay out of this, let them deal with it, because uh, we've tried for a long time, we've lost a lot of lives, spent a lot of money, and we've uh, allowed a mess to develop, and there's nothing but a mess and chaos there, and in a way, we're partially responsible for that. In other news, a record number of illegal African migrants are heading to Europe this year. More on the EU struggle to hold back the tide in just a moment, including the latest mass border storming incident. Also, a third day of race riots in Missouri, where angry crowds refuse to be quelled over the police shooting of an unarmed black teenager. In a few minutes, we take a closer look at how officers are handling the situation.